Hey guys, so parosmia is distortion in the smell. When things are smelling bad, the flowers smell like rotten food and all of that. Those are common complications after COVID-19. If you did not have it, you never heard of it, but if you have it, it kind of distorts your life. And to get you the treatment that you need for this, we have the luxury of interview a specialist in ENT, ear, nose, and throat, and specialized in rhinology, Dr. Amrita Ray. And today we'll dive deep in all the possible and new treatments that you can use for parasmia that you can use at home and you can discuss with your doctor at the clinic. So let's dive right into it. So parosmia is when you have a altered sense of smell. So um, anosmia is when you completely lose your sense of smell. Parosmia is when you have a distorted sense where food or items may smell different from what they used to or completely off um, in nature. So a lot of the theories uh, around parosmia are thought to be a neural dysregulation, meaning the wires that are essentially going from point A of when you smell a molecule, it touches your olfactory epithelium at the top of your nose, and then a series of electrical signals go through your brain and it, it triggers a sense of smell, a memory that is associated with this. Um, and so the thought process is, is that when the virus affects this pathway at some place, uh, at some point amongst this, that rather than going to the original um, smell, thought, uh, memory of this, it ends up getting rerouted to the wrong place. And so what um, may be a memory of, you know, lemons or cake or something that is positive ends up getting rerouted to something that smells like burnt coffee or chicken or something else that is completely inappropriate. So we don't have a great answer for that, unfortunately. Um, the thoughts are that it affects the actual neural transmission pathway in terms of how the um, uh, networks are aligned in the brain. I would have to defer to you for, for a better understanding of that. That's the neurologist, yeah. <laughs> so parosmia can be caused by a variety of different things. Um, viral infections are one of the most common reasons that we see patients coming into our clinics for this. Um, even before COVID, that was something that we did see for viral infections in general, although not necessarily at the same rates that we have started seeing recently. Um, other things that can cause parosmia include different sorts of inflammatory conditions inside the nose, polyps, if you've got an infection going on, so pus inside the nose can really alter the way that those molecules get in, any sort of obstruction, so um, tumors, again, polyps are, are one of the things that we see frequently, but any sort of obstruction inside the nose can cause um, parosmia or anosmia. So what we've noticed is that processed foods tend to be a stronger trigger for patients having foul taste. Um, processed foods tend to give off a more metallic sensation or a chemically induced issue. So I would recommend sticking to more organic materials. Um, meats tend to also be a trigger for patients. So chicken and egg is one that we've seen very commonly. Um, that are, are very off-putting to patients. Coffee is one that a lot of us, you know, ha ritually have every morning, and that has become a very um, off-putting thing as well. So items with very strong scents, very spicy um, flavor profiles, and processed foods tend to be some of the most offending um, uh, triggers for parosmia. So I would say that if your parosmia is not getting better um, over the course of several months, I think it would be absolutely wise to get an ENT evaluation to at least look in your nose and make sure that there's not something else going on that could be potentially addressed. Um, you know, barring any sort of physical barrier that is preventing recovery, um, much of this is a slower process. but. Again, a, a lot of our treatment options are geared around physical tr therapy, essentially, for the olfactory nerve to get this to essentially heal in the way that we want it to. A lot of the treatments are focused on 
um, improving quality of life and decreasing um, worsening progression of symptoms, right? So in terms of improving quality of life, one is going to be making sure that we find appropriate diets and smells that aren't going to make this worse, finding an appropriate um, foods that you're going to be able to tolerate, and then doing uh, therapy in terms of olfactory training to be able to strengthen your sense of smell and realign those um, neural connections. In terms of other medications, we unfortunately don't have great um, magic pills that we can provide to help fix this. Um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, interest in looking at variety of homeopathic and supplemental type of medicines, such as fish oil, omega-3s, um, zinc, vitamin A, um, and those things may potentially show some benefit, but it is very, very early on in those stages, and those medicines or those supplements can definitely interact with other medications that you're on and can be harmful if you take them in large quantities. So for example, zinc is something that we frequently see people are interested in, um, and we have seen people go overboard, but it's important to note that if you go overboard with some of these things, they are known to cause anosmia or parosmia in and of itself. So it's something that you want to be very careful about. Um, you know, so small dosing supplementation is probably okay, but I would be cautious about overdoing any of these treatments um, simply because you may end up doing more harm than good. So again, um, I think that this is a very frustrating condition and it's important to find out and document the things that work for you. Um, that includes finding the smells that you're smelling and how keeping a track with a diary of how those things are improving or changing over time. And the same thing with foods, making a journal of the foods that you can eat, um, utilizing those in, in a time frame. And if, they are, if, they are, if you have aversions to them using a nasal clip or um, some sort of barrier method to help you at least tolerate food and then revisiting them um, in a couple weeks or a month or two months to see if that has changed at all, if that's progressing. Sometimes certain foods and tastes are going to be less aversion um, or they will be less dull. Um, and those are all signs of improvement. So don't get discouraged by that. So again, the timeline for this is going to be a long, it's like running a marathon. It's going to be a longer term um, recovery and it can take up to several months, even up to a full year for this to recover. Um, the worst prognosis is for patients who have completely lost their sense of smell and continue to lose their sense of smell 100% several months down the road from their initial infection. So three to six months if you completely have lost your sense of smell, that's generally the worst prognosis. Fortunately, there are very few people in that category that we have found. Most patients will at least have some recovery of their sense of smell and that is a great sign that most of their sense of smell, if not all of it, is going to recover. Yeah, so, um, you know, there's definitely clinical trials going on all across the country in terms of trying to figure out if there's um, medicines or supplements um, that can be uh, helpful in this. So, for example, theophylline is a medicine um, that is used inside the nose that can potentially improve some of the inflammation um, associated with this and potentially have um, a, a benefit for patients. However, that's in a clinical trial. So there are, um, there's research ongoing all across the country and, uh, and frankly all across the world um, trying to address this issue. There are two great websites. Um, one is called Absent, which is based in the UK, and then there's another one also based in the UK called Fifth Sense um, that do a great job of explaining some of the resources and studies that are ongoing and if you would be eligible to um, participate in some of these. We are looking at a specific pool of patients who um, haven't recovered as quickly as the general population. So sometimes it's frustrating to see um, that this is a really big problem. But I will say that in general, this does tend to improve. Um, it is a slow process, but there are other people out there, stay strong. Um, and you know that we're all working on trying to figure out better methods to help patients get better faster. 
Wow, that was a comprehensive review right there. Thank you, Dr. Ray, for this insight. And to learn more about loss of smell and anosmia, that can also linger for a long time after contracting COVID-19. See this interview with Dr. Ray and see you in the next one.